Hi, Robert. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I'd like to go back to your very beginning. I know you come from California. Let me know like what part of California and tell me, tell me, tell everyone a little bit about where you grew up. I, I grew up in uh, what is now called Silicon Valley, and I still live here, in fact. When I was growing up, it wasn't called that. It was called the Santa Clara Valley. I grew up uh, right near Stanford University. My grandparents and my great-grandparents were both professors at Stanford. That ended up becoming sort of the heart of the technology cliche, I suppose. But there was still a bit of agriculture here when I was a kid. Uh, this area used to be fruit orchards and uh, primarily Spanish rancheros before the Americans came. So it's got a deep history. You know, so much of that history is, is pre-Columbian history. Um, the San Francisco Bay, when the Spanish got here in the 1600s, I think around 1640, if I'm not mistaken, I, I might be wrong there. They said that there were so many birds on San Francisco Bay that when they took off with a gunshot, they would obscure the sun. Anthropologists usually saying that that hunter-gatherer civilizations can only sustain about an average of one human per square kilometer. The San Francisco Bay once had 10,000 Native Americans around its edges. It's a lush place. I, I had a, a fairly comfortable upbringing in a, a family that wasn't wealthy, but had a lot of uh, leanings towards academia and technology. My father was an engineer, an aerospace engineer. Basically, he was a, a microwave physicist. He designed low frequency sensors for a satellite back in the 60s. And he did some spook things for SRI. Um, but yeah, so I, I grew up in a in a very technological family and kind of a nerdy place. So now when you think back to the uh, Bay Area at that time, the, you know, Silicon Valley now, was it, in your mind, was it better before all this technological growth with companies? Did you prefer it more when you had the plants and agriculture versus mass you know, production of people and buildings? I loved to go up in the hills and ride my bike in the grass and play in what was really rolling grassy hills. And that became developments back in the 70s. So yes, I would say that I preferred the open space and I preferred a little bit of uh, space between the towns. Uh, it used to be that each each town had a little bit of gap of population between the boundaries. Since the late 70s and 80s, those gaps have all filled in. We, in fact, we live right now in Mountain View, which is right around the corner from Google headquarters. Quite literally, we live around the corner from where some of the very first browsers were invented at Netscape and Cisco, you know, the routers were made and Sun Microsystems and my wife worked at Apple. I met my wife. We were at the birthday of a person who coined the term virtual reality, Jaron Lanier, common friends with the first employee at Apple. We saw the growth. We were part of the growth and it happened all around of us. People I went to high school with started companies and things like that. A little weird, I'd say. I, I don't really feel part of it. I feel like a spectator. I'm not sure that it's all beneficial. It certainly makes people a lot of money, but I'm not really sure it makes everybody happy. N nothing makes everybody happy. So, you know, I, I'm often craving for that kind of escape back to, a, I, don't, I don't know, some, some green paradise, I suppose. Tell me this, and I know it's unrelated to exactly what you're saying, but yet um, I'm always kind of keeping track of geography as a filmmaker, as a boy, I've done that. How far away is the Winchester house from you? Because in my mind, though I've never been there, I know that it must be around that area. It's in uh, San Jose, Campbell border, and it's about oh, 10, 15 miles south of us. Yes. Okay. Well, wow. have you been in it? No, never have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you think that your hometown area contributed to any of the style of music that you create? As a filmmaker, I can actually think of, quite often I'll think back to you know, high school with a friend, doing something, the town I lived in, going out on Halloween with my friends, telling ghost stories. So I think that, like I grew up in Seattle, north of Seattle, so it was Everett, Snohomish, Washington. But I, I do quite often feel that that environment with woods, mountains, nature, contributes to the way I think today and probably the things I appreciate might be different than someone say from New York City. I actually appreciate a lot of those things more than I do technology personally. I would say as far as growing up, I mean, regarding the influence on the music, certainly the frogs in the creek taught me polyrhythms. Being able to have a, a bedroom with windows that opened at my grandparents' house and on rainy spring mornings, I could open those windows and hear the rain in the trees, the creek outside. And it was, it was quite amazing to be able to grow up there. I, I was only there for a handful of years in my high school years because my 
my grandparents died when I was uh, like in the late early 70s, I guess. We moved there probably around 1977 or 8, but I, I would grow up, I would go and play there. They, they lived just a mile from where I grew up. My parents' house and my grandparents' house were just down the street, in other words. And another interesting aspect of that regarding musical styles is interesting because I have early memories as a kid of hearing the Grateful Dead practice in a garage behind the house I grew up in. Menlo Park, the town I actually grew up in, was where Ken Kesey and the Pranksters were. Perry Street, the house that he talks about uh, in some of his autobiographies, you know, the Merry Pranksters were, were renting as well. And the, I remember as a little kid, the uh, further bus was parked there and, and, and Neil Cassidy would drive the further bus between Menlo Park and La Honda uh, to pick people up and drive them back down into town and things. Turns out that my aunt was kind of partying with those guys all around me without me knowing it as a five-year-old were, were the Grateful Dead practicing the, the, the roots of psychedelia, really. I didn't know that. I was a kid, but I do remember riding my bike down to the back of uh, Lake Lagunita on Stanford campus and seeing all the, the, the naked sunbathers in the flower child kind of era in the late 60s and thinking, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this was a good thing, this feeling of freedom. And I, you know, I remember coming home weekday nights and my father would get home from work and we'd put on the news and the Vietnam War would be on TV. Seeing that direct conflict in my mind between the hippie culture and flower children sunbathing and napalm and people getting shot, I quickly figured out what I preferred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and although I never was a good hippie, I was way too nerdy and, and organized in my life for that. I actually always felt a very strong kinship to counterculture and to pacifism and in a general sense that, uh, that we could do better. You might be a little too young to remember this, but I have to ask it because it was, you know, me and my wife watch a lot of True Prime. And, you know, being a filmmaker as well, I know there's been a movie or two made about this particular situation. And I know you're not far from San Francisco. Do you remember as a boy anything with Zodiac? I do remember news about the Zodiac killer. I don't remember specifics, but I also remember when Patty Hearst was kidnapped. And that was fascinating because when I went to Stanford as an undergraduate, I became a psychology major. My faculty advisor and the person who I worked for quite a bit was Philip Zimbardo, who was an expert witness, both the Patty Hearst trial and also in the Jim Jones uh, massacre trials because he was an expert in cult psychology and mind control. I was working for him in the laboratory building electronics and things. We, in fact, had this direct connection with some of that strange undercurrent that was happening, the dark shadows around the counterculture, I guess you'd say. But also, it was very interesting to see how optimism could turn into very dark things, the right kind of manipulation. Yes, of course, humans are capable of all sorts of dark, dark things, and they're also capable of some pretty amazing things. Now, speaking of that, and I don't mean to interrupt you, when you were at Stanford, were you there when John Elway was there? Yes, yes, we were. Uh, he was one year older than me. It's interesting because I was mostly hanging out with people in the co-ops, and uh, the Synergy co-op was right next to one of the, the main fraternities that had a lot of the football guys, and and, and one of the long-haired freaks uh, who was, was at Synergy, remembered uh, having John Elway stick his head out the window and yell, hey, you're a faggot, which I'm sure John either doesn't remember or wouldn't admit if he did. <laughs> yeah, especially in today's world, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. You went during the same time, and I guess you might probably didn't know him. When I was in high school, like I said, Everett, Washington. And at the time, there were three high schools really in that area that were big. You had Everett High School, which was called the Everett Seagulls. You had Cascade High School, which was south of Everett. That's the high school I went my two, first two years, and they were called Cascade Bruins. Famous people have come from there, like Patrick Duffy, the man from Atlantis. It was also on Dallas the actor. And then there was a high school in the Valley called Snohomish, which were like the farm boys. And we ended up moving there in my last two years. So I went to that school the last two years of my high school. The reason I brought up that at all was when I was going there, there was a guy that was a year ahead of me that was at Everett. He was a quarterback and he ended up becoming a professional quarterback in the NFL. And I think he played John Elway. His name was Chris Chandler and okay. he was the quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons. Although, you know, what's funny is that Back in the early 70s, my parents were season tickets holders at Stanford, and I saw Jim Plunkett uh, play a lot. So that was, I was a 
was young. But, uh, well, that's interesting you bring that up because you're also in the area of Oakland. I have been an Oakland Raiders fan since I was the smallest boy. When I was a boy, there was no Seahawks. Yeah. They didn't exist. They came in when I was about 11. Now they're the Las Vegas Raiders. What is it that initially made you gravitate towards ambient music? Because when I think back to the 70s, which I grew up in too, I'm a little... I think I'm two years younger than you. When I think of ambient, I don't think of it like we know today. Um, I think of like Tangerine Dream, like Weather Report, like kind of smooth, like like jazz, and kind of like a little more free-flowing versions of music. Obviously it evolved after that time and you were one of the pioneers. Talk to me about how that happened. Like I always thought of the music I make as just very hermetic and very personal. I was very aware, of course, of the developments in music, especially singing in church choirs when I was a kid and then tried to learn viola for six weeks or something. Then started playing my parents' piano and I really loved Keith Jarrett. You know, I wanted to sound like Keith Jarrett. Try and practice and things, but I also really, really like uh, German electronic music and anything that had synthesizers in it. And I was starting to build my own synths when I was about 13. So I wanted to sound, I wanted to sound like, I wanted to sound like Tangerine Dream and I wanted to sound like Tim Blake or whatever, you know, Gong and Klaus Schultz. Of course, I didn't have the money to, to make, to, to build a Moog modular because <laughs> you couldn't. <laughs> I was very aware of this development in psychedelic music that was moving more towards fully instrumental, electronic, abstract, psychedelic music. A huge influence from public sponsored radio station, it wasn't PBS, it was uh, listener sponsored, uh, KPFA in Berkeley. They had a, a music director named Charles Amarkanian, who also is a composer and a uh, sound poet himself. And he got to be friends with a lot of composers in the kind of Mills College cohort of what I would call tonal minimalism or tonal experimental music and this would include people like Pauline Oliveros and Terry Riley also the minimalists Steve Reich and, and Philip Glass and he would help to introduce people to amazing music of living composers people like Lou Harris was more or less the innovator of American gamelan music or Colin Nancaro who in fact everybody thought he had vanished and was perhaps dead Amerikanian went to Mexico City and discovered Nancaro still there working back in the 19 late 1970s and brought tapes back uh, Nancaro was not allowed to come back to the United States because he was fighting for the the, the socialists during the the Spanish Civil War uh, like like many of the people who came back to the United States having fought for the historically correct side, they weren't allowed back in because they were considered anarchists or communists. Nancaro found himself stripped of his U.S. citizenship or perhaps at least residency, landed in Mexico City in the 19, late 1930s and was composing there on player piano for 20, 30, 40 years. In the 70s, he was still alive. Amerikanian brought him to the United States. He thought he was going to get arrested when he got here. We had access to this incredible music, including Indian classical music because we had uh, Ali Akbar Khan School of Music in San Rafael uh, on the north side of San Francisco Bay, technological skills from South India and bring their culture as well. That music was immensely influential to me, as was Terry Riley, who I remember getting scolded by the Western classical elite when he decided to, to study Indian singing with uh, Pandit Pranath back in the late 60s along with John Hassel. There was this undercurrent of American avant-garde that was specifically connected to the counterculture, to psychedelic culture, but also to tonalism, a new kind of tonalism, based upon uh, world music, based upon a, an awareness of Indian classical music or Southeast Asian Indonesian music. Uh, it was often modal and it was often microtonal, uh, taking a hint from Harry Parch, for example, with his 43 note per octave tuning and his own home built instruments. There was this bubbling up tonal avant garde that grew in the 60s and was bursting out in the 70s with minimalism and Reich and Glass and Riley. And that for me was a very big awakening because when I heard Terry Riley and I realized that he had written In C in 1964 and then Rainbow and Curved Air in 1968. And a lot of the German space music guys were really trying to do Terry Riley, but they didn't have the chops. They couldn't play it by hand. So they figured out how to get a Moog sequencer to do it instead. When you make that connection and realize that Terry Riley was this thread that moved in between Western modernist avant-garde, Eastern classical music, Indian classical music, and the psychedelic culture, which became minimal space music and electronic music, you, you, you see this thread that uh, I, I still feel that I'm 
part of the, the fabric of that. And I, I keep coming back to my love for Terry Riley. A lot of people have forgotten the the immense influence that, that he had. For example, he was one of the inventors of tape loops for Petronix, right? Well, right. In, 19, in 1963, he and David Allen from Gong were in Paris selling leftist newspapers and experimenting with tape loops. All of this stuff comes full around in the San Francisco Tape Music Center, which ended up at Mills College. Morton Subotnick was also working and Pauline Oliveros. This is definitely part of a kind of San Francisco outgrowth of, of beatnik and psychedelic culture. I, I've always, it's interesting you should bring up all the world music, other culture music that kind of connects with ambient. I've always thought of ambient music as something that grounds me. I listen to Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Van Halen, Dawkins. I'm a heavy metal guy. I like punk. Um, I skipped my high school graduation to see the last Robin Gristle concert. So I'm a metal guy, but I'm also a filmmaker. So when I listen to film music, I've always thought of ambient as a cousin to film scoring because you're kind of using moody, whatever instrumentation you use, whether it's orchestration, electronics, homemade instruments, to create mood and atmosphere. And a lot of times it's something very simple like John Carpenter. And when you listen to John Carpenter's music, he doesn't play a lot of notes, but yet everyone will tell you how great he is that is truly film appreciative of film music. He's even gone on tour with his music and has sold out shows all over the world. And yet he does a lot of droning and weird, like just underscoring. And I love that stuff. Now it's not to say I don't like John Williams or Morricone or whatever. I, when I when I think of ambient music, I find that it, it gives me a balance from listening to Metallica and Megadeth and Judas Priest, ambient music to relax me, to kind of calm me. I, I'll tell you what, it's some of the music I go to when I'm most emotional, like when my father died. And when I go right before I do a movie, when I'm about to direct a film, quite often I'll listen to move, movie music, but I might also listen to ambient. Very rarely would it be heavy metal because I, I want that stillness. I want that quietness. I want to be able to think. How do you feel about film music? Don't have a deep connection to film music in particular because I find myself highly stimulated by music on its own. And so I don't generally think of music as being something that needs to accompany image. And I do sometimes help with film sound design mostly. I think my music is generally too uh, distracting for film scores because the music has to play second fiddle always to the story. It has to subsume itself under the characters and become part of the fabric of the, the film. I tend to make slow music that I do because I'm probably hyper aroused. I think I am generally hypersensitive to the environment around me. And so when things are very active, I tend to shut down. I tend to go neutral. The more stimulus there is, the the more I just basically uh, disconnect. It's interesting you say that because it's one of the problems I have with some of television today and movies. They feel like, you always hear about, we have an attention deficit society. Well, I, I think that sometimes they play too much into the design of a movie or of a television show where they're cramming it with rapid fire dialogue the whole time. They're purposely cutting quick because they feel like they gotta cut just to cut, which I think is not a smart move. But I find sometimes it's less, a lot less enjoyable when they approach a movie like that or a TV show. Um, for me too. I, I My favorite directors are the ones that hold a camera for five minutes. I mean, I love Tarkovsky. Uh, you know, I love Bergman. Essentially, if, if you give me a film by Tarkovsky, it'll be something I can soak into for hours. And after a three and a half hour film, it's almost not long enough. The thing is that, that you know, if you give me an 80 minute blow em up Hollywood action film, I'm bored after the first five minutes because it's it's just empty of anything that that makes me want to be there. I just actually just want to leave the room. And so I, I think regarding the role of ambient music and picture or ambient music in service to things. Certainly, film music has a very specific role of being subservient to the story. I personally, as, as you might know if you've read my interviews, I have a little trouble with the term ambient music because it implies background. I understand that when Brian Eno coined that term or you know, marketed that term, it was to sell the idea that, that music could be interesting in the background, that it didn't have to be lame didn't have to be stupid. That's all fine. But I actually think of what I do as being more like the, in the term that Pauline Oliveros coined, which is deep listening music. And I like that term because it gives instructions to the listener. It doesn't describe the music itself. If there is a situation where you can benefit by paying attention, then you'll get something more nutritious out of it than if you're just a passive observer. Music in this genre that, that we're 
generally talking around as being ambient. The stuff that's the most interesting is actually slightly difficult, slightly edgy, a little too invasive to be background music. It, it sort of pokes into your ear a little too hard, but it doesn't keep going. It just kind of says, I'm here, and if you want to pay attention, you'll get something really interesting and maybe a very deep experience, a lot of emotion or a lot of journeying into your own mind. I think that it's music that's not afraid of introversion. It's music that's not afraid of what I like to call spelunk, which is to go deep inside of your own mind and to find memories, to things, to have things pull up from your depths that you might have forgotten, and that perhaps even they aren't always comfortable. Particularly like to find the places in my memory that I've shut down that I can reopen and find out more about existence and, and why it means something. And I think if the music has a certain quiet to it if, it, if it's a little bit less forceful and it doesn't have those quick cuts like you're talking about the modern television, then it allows just a little bit of a slowdown, a little centering, and something deeper can happen, perhaps. I would agree with that. So when you first started recording music, it's a very different time now, I'm sure, versus then in terms of technology, the ease of using what all these computer software programs, et cetera, can record, mix, edit, et cetera. And the musical outlets that were available back then, like record labels, obviously you didn't have streaming. So when you think of when you started out versus what it's like today, how would you describe the differences and what do you like more? There's so many different things when you're young. First of all, you don't have a lot of skills or experience. And so everything you do is new and exciting. And you're gonna take the first idea every time because it's all you know how to do. I used to think really hard about what I thought art should be and how should one think about art. I used to think about defining it and finding ways of directing myself forward in a focused manner. But the music itself, it was very primitive because I had a, you know, a pile of homemade modular synthesizer, cheap electronics. Eventually by about 1980 or so, I was able to buy a used, barely operational Prophet 5 synthesizer that had been returned <laughs> to the company. I mean, a new Prophet 5 was, was $3,500. But I had friends that were employees there and they could get me one for 500, which was about all that I had. And that was a huge breakthrough for me. So I had only cassette tapes. I didn't have a reel-to-reel -reel yet. I would record live to cassette because I didn't have a multi-track. I would set up self-running sounds on the modular synth and I would have the lap steel guitar in my lap or flute on a microphone and the keyboard in front of me. And I would just kind of like sit on the ground and try to, to make as many interesting sounds as I could at once because it was all live. You know, then I figured out that I could record one part to cassette and then play that cassette back through the mixer while I was also playing and then I could overdub onto another cassette. Some of the tracks on my first couple albums were done that way and, the, and other tracks on those albums were live. It, it's primitive and, the, and the, the lack of technological convenience often made it more exciting and made it well, you just you didn't know any better at the time you just had what you had you weren't waiting for a workstation to come around you weren't waiting for 1998 and pro tools to finally get working you know we're talking 1979 or so when i was just starting to record i was still in high school you know you do what you can <laughs> and, what, and what about the outlets then did you have a place where you could have that played or was it just for you <laughs> well the the first thing I did that I thought was good enough, the, the Hearts of Space radio show was live on KPFA on Sunday nights with Stephen Hill. And that was about the only show that was playing the kind of music I was making, which we were calling space music at the time. I did a piece finally that I thought was the sort of thing that Stephen Hill would be likely to play in 1980. And I sent him a cassette, made him a cassette copy, and he played it. It was the first time I ever got played on the radio. You know, I was 17. That was, that was cool, but that was, about it there was no distribution there were no record labels people who were making this kind of music were distributing it themselves they were printing records and driving around to record stores and consigning when i i didn't have enough money to print a record and i also had my, my music was too long form i was making 45 and 30 minute long pieces so it couldn't fit on a record and so i was printing cassettes uh with my own money and then finding distributors that were selling to things like tower records the first lesson i got in the music biz was when i found this one distributor who shall go nameless i think he's no longer in business since 35 years now. He took 20 or 30 of my first cassette, Shinyata. About a month later, he called me up and asked for some more copies. And I said, so you've sold the first ones? He said, yeah. I said, so where's the money? I said, oh, I don't have the money. Well, you sold them. Yeah, but I don't have the money. Okay, when are you gonna get me the money? Well, I'll try to do that as soon as I get, well, okay. So I sent him another like 15 or 20 copies. Two or three months more go by and 
he still hasn't paid me a thing. And so I'm on the phone with him and, and he says, well, I just don't have the money. I said, but you've been selling this stuff. Where's the money? Well, I don't have it. I can't pay you. And that was my first real lesson in doing the music business. <laughs> Be real careful. Assholes everywhere. And they're trying to take advantage of people. You know, I said, well, I was like 18, 19 years old. And I was thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? Take you to small claims court? And he said, well, sure. And if you win, I still can't pay you. So in, in that regard, is the situation slightly better today that you could sell your music on your own and get your, the money yourself? Well, well, then we have Spotify, which is kind of like a professional endorsed ripoff artist. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it's bootlegging legally. I, I'm not in a position anymore to complain because I'm so much better off elderly status than, than most people trying to start. And the only reason I have that good fortune is that I was lucky enough to be on a good, fair record label during a time when a fair record label could actually sell some copies, they could market music, and they could actually pay their artists. The Hearts of Space record label, which is what released about 11 of my albums, 1989 until 98, I mean to say. There are some problems. I mean, the contracts I signed with them are in perpetua as long as the albums are in print. And of course, now that the internet's here, everything's in print forever, which yeah. means I don't have those 11, you know, those 11 titles are gone to me. I make, you know, a few dollars a year off them, a few hundred dollars a year off. Luckily, I have 40 or so other albums I've released myself. But what I've learned is to be in business for myself, control my own destiny. If I didn't have the good fortune of having a label help get my name out there for 10 years, I probably wouldn't be in a situation right now where I could release my own music and actually sell enough to live. Part of it's because the luck of the decade, a few of us were still alive or alive enough in time to benefit from an era where music sales or media sales, if you're talking about film, could actually bring in direct income where people had to buy a thing. Ethos of the internet, which I think is a wonderful thing, the idea of free information, free exchange, has a underbelly reducing the value of all people who create the content that everybody is enjoying for free. Now, I, I paused when I said that because I hate the word content. The, the metaphor that I've used, th there was a battle between well-meaning fans of the arts 15 years ago or so, in the, in the early 2000s. Some people, you know, were taken down by the fans, Lars Ulrich from Metallica, Metallica for, for coming out publicly saying Napster was bad and that they were stealing music. He wasn't wrong. No, he wasn't wrong. The fans hated him for it. And a lot of people were saying, well, the RIAA is ripping everyone off and the record companies are ripping everyone off too. And they were wrong. In fact, record companies were helping people survive. Yes, there's a lot of criminality in the record companies. What was going on, in fact, was a strong propaganda campaign from internet providers to justify the throughput that they were providing because they were making money on throughput, not on the information itself. And the metaphor that I've used for years is that if you are in the business of making pipelines, you're selling pipelines by the mile. You're selling concrete, you're selling stainless steel, you're selling, you don't care what goes through that pipe. You're just selling pipeline and you're selling a rent to use that pipeline. Whatever comes out the other end isn't your problem. It doesn't matter because you're just selling the pipe. Well, the reason why a lot of the internet providers and the fans of the media, the fans of the internet, were so quick to uh, attack the artists that were trying to point out the problem is that they were getting fed a lot of propaganda about how wonderful the internet was going to be where everybody could exchange their information and everybody could be an artist, everybody could be on stage. There's some truth to that and that's what YouTube is. And you can quickly see that standard of everybody be an artist is cat videos. So not to denigrate the wonderful uh, ability for people to be their own artists, and I think we all want to be that. We all started being that. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to say I'm better than you because I had a record label once. Uh, that's, that's not the point. We are all scrambling to the bottom. We're all scrambling to a place where there is nothing to benefit from making anything. The only people making money are going to be the ones making the pipe. If you happen to be drilling for crude oil or actually just pumping sludge through the pipe or sewage, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's going through the pipe. They'll make their money. When an ambient artist creates a piece, a record, not just a song, but I like to call albums because myself personally, I don't like to listen to just songs. I want to listen to complete performances from beginning to end. And that's something that is gone by the wayside with these streaming things. When you, as an ambient or a creator, come up with an idea for, say, an album, a lot of times ambient albums uh, don't have a lot of notes. And there's these shifts in momentum, tempo, instrumentation, 
nature sounds, rainfall, whatever it may be. Do you hear those changes in advance? Like, do you say at three minutes, I'm going to do this, five minutes, seven minutes, seven and a half, ten, or do they happen just naturally? Because the reason I ask it as a filmmaker, I'm a very visual director and not every director is. And that's not saying I'm better. That's just the way I work as a filmmaker. So when I, when I do a scene, I see the shots before we get there. Actually, when I'm writing the script, I don't always necessarily put them in the script because you're quote unquote, not supposed to because they're too distracting to see shot. But when you see a shooting script of mine, you'll see every visualized shot. It may be one shot for the whole scene. It could also be 20 shots. There's a rhythm and sometimes almost a mathematic formula. Not that I'm copying from somebody else, but that I see for this scene. Do you see that in your head before you make an album? Do you see those, those signposts when the music changes? Because for me in ambience, sometimes those shifts are very gradual and you have to really pay attention. And I'm just curious, like how you come to those those movements. First of all, some of my albums have a lot of notes. My, my last album, Neurogenesis, is very dense and, and full of, of cycle patterning and, and, you know, 30 second note riffles and things, and is driven by a very compositional mentality. So sometimes, I mean, although I don't write notes with dots on a piece of paper with staves, um, I'm thinking very much in terms of composition. A lot of times it is intuitive though, even if you are Stravinsky or Bartok or something, you're still using your inner compass and your intuition for when a structure needs to shift or, or how notes change and when they come back back around and echo themselves. Every composer and every individual composition has its own logic. A sense of pacing, I think, is essential for anything. And, and I think pacing defines different composers. Uh, if I'm working on one of my sleep music releases, they're eight hours long or seven hours long, that's going to have a structure that's based in blocks of 30 minutes. So it's one composition that's seven hours long. It's constantly shifting. And that shift is going to be slow enough that you can't notice it. My intention is that you only hear that it's changed if you if you jump across in 10 minute skips, and then you'll realize that it's constantly changing. If you listen as a continuous flow, hopefully, if I did my job, barely recognize when an element comes in or leaves. And that's part of the specific pacing to my sleep music. However, for an album like, let's use something like What We Left Behind, which is a fairly thematic album. It's almost filmic in some ways. The idea is you're flying over Earth long after humans are extinct, maybe thousands or million years after humans are extinct and you're seeing the extent to which the earth has recovered from our devastation. Each episode within what we left behind is like a chapter of a place, of a view, of an overfly. And so it's very visual in fact. There's scenes where I picture flying over the ocean and, and seeing whales, you know, breaching underneath me. And other scenes where I imagine a meadow filled with with animals in, engaged in, in activities that might be as complex as the things our society imagines it's doing. The idea being that each one of these chapters tells a story within a novel, as it were, and or a film, but it's a sonic film, it's a sonic journey. And what I love about that is that because there's no specific visuals and there's no specific libretto, people can write their own story. They can be moved by the sonic landscapes, but find their own visuals. That was something that I drawn to music for that reason. I was painting when I was a kid. It was a frustrated surrealist. I was painting my dreams and, and hallucinations. When I say hallucinations, I was a straight kid. I didn't take drugs, but I was able to basically close my mind and listen to music and have out-of-body experiences and have animated things happen inside, you know, behind my eyelids. I understood what shamanism was long before I ever knew what drugs were. So there was an ability for me to always journey. And I was trying for years to paint those visions, to paint those journeys. And they felt like an insipid snapshot of, of something, and really like a bad cartoon, of something that was that was much more vivid and more alive. And so out of frustration, I realized that that this abstract kind of music that I was attracted to, which I was actually using, find my visions. I would put on a Klaus Schultz record and I would lay down and close my eyes and have a vision. I realized that pursue more that language, the shamanic realm or the visualized realm, the, the imaginal, by letting people experience it themselves. And so by being an instigator, by planting a seed with the music, I could hope that perhaps I was spreading an empowerment 
of vision. And that was the goal. That was really the life's work. Did you ever get to a point where either you weren't where you wanted to be versus say someone else you idolized or that your work was not as good, whether because you didn't have the resources, the money, the equipment. Did you ever struggle with that? Like, like you wanted to be this, but you were really never going to be that because you're yourself. Did you ever struggle with that? Because I know uh, I did a little bit because it took a while to realize, you know, I'm not John Carpenter, not Jim Cameron. I'm not, you know, Steven Spielberg. I'm Terry Wickham. The movies I make are going to end up being me, which in the end is really good, but it kind of takes a little maturity to get to that point. And I, I think I've been that way for 10, 15 years, but maybe before that, you know, like, doggone it, I can't get them whatever. My work doesn't look quite like I want it to be. Did you ever have that kind of struggle at all in your field? Sure. That's part of maybe what I was referring to when, when I mentioned as a teenager, I was trying to imagine what art school would teach you and trying to imagine how to define what it is that I do with purpose. Part of that is that I recognize the importance of, of individual intention. There's actually... It, it's, it's part of what essentially would be, sociologists would call it imitative magic, perhaps, but basically visualizing something until it actually exists. One thing is when you're very heavily influenced by somebody, as I might be with Terry Riley, for example, avoid that, stay away from it, steer away, because I didn't have his chops, and I didn't have the equipment that Klaus Schultz had or Tangerine Dream had, I was on a high school's budget. What I could do was find ways of making like insect noises with my modular synth. I could create drones. I had a tape echo and I could play lap steel guitar through it. I had a few things. I only knew how to do a couple things. I learned how to play flute from an itinerant bamboo flute salesman who ended up being a wonderful influencer and, and made instruments that were on a lot of Tom Waits albums. His name is Daryl DeVore, flute salesman on Stanford campus. And I would go over there in high school to go to the record store to, to, to shop for records. And I started to talk with him and learned how to play flute from him and picked up a few six and ten dollar bamboo flutes. And they became part of my instrumentation. You have the few things you can do and you can't do them as well as the famous people, but you have a specific combination of skills. And I think everybody, if they dig deep enough, can find that they have a specific combination which is uniquely them. You find a way to tell a story with these elements. You know, if, if you only have four skills, let's say they're the four characters in your story, and you make a story with it. You know, maybe it's Waiting for Godot, where there's only a few characters and they're talking about nothing at a bus stop. It's still unique. It's something that is specific. The metaphor that I discovered that works for me, this is maybe a bit arcane, in the Prajma Paramitra Sutra, the, the Diamond Sutra, Northern Indian and, and later imported into Chan Buddhism, Southern China, uh, document uh, metaphorically discussing the nature of, uh, there's a metaphor called Indra's net. In this metaphor, the god Indra, the creator of the universe, is a fisherman and he has a cottage in the center of creation. Every night he casts his net out the window. The net is made of knots of diamonds and each knot is a reflection, reflecting diamond. In the window of his cottage is a candle burning and the net spanning out across the sky is reflecting the candle in his window in each of these diamonds. Each of these diamonds is a mind. Each of these diamonds is a consciousness. And they all think that they have this light in them. And in fact, they're all reflecting the same light. And they see each other reflecting a different light from different angles, every one of them looking like a different color. And yet, it's all the same light from this center. To me, the way I interpret this, when we dig down into the most secret, the most hermetic place in our memories, in our consciousness, and in our uniqueness, we'll find something that is perhaps very crazy, very unique, very weird. If we can convey that, if we can communicate that as distilled a way as possible, also in a way that allows other people to understand it, then its uniqueness will also be the most unfiltered, the most polished version of the origins. So in other words, if we all represent one instantiation of all of creation as a human meat bag in this 80 period, 80 year period of time, 60 year period of time, whatever it is, our existence as an animal on earth 
in the 21st century is specifically ours, yours, somebody else's, unique. That also represents the universal experience of what got us here and what made us unique. And so if we can actually express that personal, private, hermetic way possible, then we will be expressing the reason why we're here in the universe for everybody, and it's all uniquely the same. It's a very abstract way to put it, but essentially the, the story is that we all have influences and we all have to work through them. And those influences make us who we are. And our unique sets of skills or lack thereof make us who we are. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get there, to realize it or appreciate it. So how did you get involved on the films that you've done sound work for? How did that come about? I think like most things in this business through friendships and through being loyal and reliable and easy to work. As far as I know, nobody's told me otherwise, but I think that I tend to not burn bridges too quickly. <laughs> Most of the people I've been friends with in my life are still friends. I, I think, I hope they would say the same. And I try to I try to be good to the friends around me. What did you specifically do for Pitch Black? One of those friends was Brian Williams, uh, Les Mord, who I did Stalker with. And Brian has been working with Graham Ravel since the 80s because they were in uh, SBK together. And Brian was doing sound design and sampling and playing steel cutter and chains on stage with SBK, which was Graham's band and his Graham's wife as well. When Graham Ravel moved to Los Angeles to start working on film, Brian moved out with him to help him with his sound library in the early 90s. Also around that time, I was introduced through friends at my record label Hearts of Space to Paul Hasslinger from Tangerine Dream, who had just moved to Los Angeles around 1991, and he was working for Christoph Franke, ghostwriting most of the Babylon 5 series. It was He wasn't allowed to talk about it, but it's, it was very well known in Hollywood at the time. Pretty much 100% of the music for Babylon 5 is actually Paul Hasslinger. This, as you might know, in Hollywood is a very common thing. People with the business contacts will get the gig, and they have to farm it off because they already have four other gigs to do, and there's deadlines. It's a shop, right? So, so Paul was part of Chris's shot was ghostwriting Babylon 5 for him. Paul and I became friends. Paul is an extremely intelligent person. When I first met him at his house, it was after a NAMM show in Anaheim. I felt like I was being interviewed and in, in, it was, he was such a curious person. He managed to get me to talk about myself the whole time. That was sneaky, <laughs> you know? I wanted to learn more about him, but he kept, he kept probing and he's like that. Very inquisitive and very intelligent person, as is Brian. What happened then, the late 90s, is uh, got a phone call and Graham Ravel was on the phone in a conference call with Brian Williams and me. They called me up and said, this is Brian Williams and this is Graham Ravel and we want to talk to you about a score. And Paul Hasslinger's working on it too. <laughs> I actually introduced Paul and Brian, connected those two. What I received was basically descriptions of a handful of scenes, and they thought that things that I could do with flutes would suit the scenes well. And this is often how I've done my film scoring work. I, I rarely get a chance to see the films. And it's not scoring. I, sh I should be very clear. My work, except in only one or two films, has been music design or sound design. The one exception is a film called Mandorla, which I did for my friend Robert Miller. He's the director and the producer, and it was basically auteur of this film, Mandorla, which is a very personal journey. It's, it's a small film about a person seeking meaning. And I was music director, music supervisor, and also the main, I, I helped find and contact the artists that he wanted to use, and I did about half the school. So the thing that happens here is that typical Graham and, and Brian are on the phone, and Graham says, so there's this scene, you know, he describes the film as being kind of aliens, like thing except the monsters are like bats. Asked if I could do some sound design that would work for a very dark side of a planet that was creepy, you know, like a scary dark scene. He said about half the film was going to be when the planet rotates into the shade and now it's dark the whole time and that's when all the bad stuff. So, okay, I need creepy desert music essentially. And, and that was their job to come up with that. But what they wanted, was this, this thing I do with flutes, which we call flute loops. Basically, it's creating layers and layers of flute. It's kind of this breathy, pumping, abstract sort of sound, which ends up in my albums all the time. And so I did a bunch of that. And then they also said, and there's this scene, which is like in a birth chamber, a little bit like the alien scene with those egg-like things, except the birth chamber is kind of like, and it's like an organic pipe organ, and these things are like bat eggs shooting out of it with screaming noises. Wondered if I could make some of the screaming noises to fit into the soundtrack. So I did these flute overblow things, like harsh, harsh, noisy 
overtone. Sent it off to them. They said, great, that's perfect. And I didn't hear from them for a year. And then the movie comes out. <laughs> that's kind of how that works. <laughs> they did all the hard work. I just come up with a few weird sounds based upon their requests. Paul Hasslinger did the same thing for me several times when he was working on the touchstone film Crazy Beautiful. He said it was kind of like a Romeo and Juliet story with a good and bad side of town. It's star-crossed lovers, right? So the Kristen Dunst character meets this this Hispanic guy who's the smart one and really hardworking, and she's a rich, lazy girl. Oh, this is what I'm told. This is like I'm given the, the quick elevator chat, basically, right? <laughs> There's a couple scenes that I'm having trouble with. One is when they meet at a Denny's. They're falling in love, and I want it to be really sweet and romantic, but also contain elements of concern, elements of future problems, right? I want some shadows to hover around this. And so he specifically gave me a few notes. He said he wanted this chord with four notes, but he said, he avoid any thirds, no major or minor thirds. That's because he was going to add a Mixolydian mode where it was going to be either major or minor. He was going to do this mixed mode thing like Bartok or whatever, you know, Stravinsky, so that it could be positive and negative at the same time. So he wanted specifically for me to stay away from any thirds. And so I did these drones with fourths and fifths and octaves, very static. But he said, I, I don't want like a string quartet. And he wants it with strings, but things that were different, sounding abstract. So I did it with wine glasses and bowed metal Asian instruments like bowed sultry and bowed uh, su chung, things like that, just to create a different texture, a different timbre that didn't sound like a string chord. Created these long drones using these bowed sounds, sent those to him. He said, great, perfect, didn't hear back. He also had one scene, which was a difficult scene, which ended up getting cut from the film. It was a Disney film, Touchstone, is Disney and they didn't want it to become R-rated. Disney had corporate problem with people smoking marijuana and actually smiling and having a good time. There was this one scene where the kids are out at night and getting stoned in their car. Cops are coming up. There's this scene where the cops are approaching and it needed this big swelling scary sound that was not too scary because it's it's a romantic drama. It's not like a horror movie, right? So right. we asked if I could come up with something that, that would sound like a bunch of happy kids in a car approached by a cop. And so, you know, did some distorted guitar and feedback loops. And of course, that scene was cut because there were pictures of kids smoking and smiling at the same time. Did, was that movie, and I'm only going by memory, and I've not looked at a phone or anything like that, like most people do today. I'm just going by strict memory. Was that movie directed by John Stockwell? I don't remember. Yeah, it might have been. The reason I asked that is because I know that Paul... Hasslinger has scored a bunch of his film. Right. Uh, like, in, what was it called? Teristas or something like that? Yeah, and, and it could have very well been. I wonder if he was the one who did Behind Enemy Lines, because that was a big train wreck. I helped Paul with Behind Enemy Lines as well. And that came out in 2001, right after 9-11. They were working on it during the summer. The director was trying to make it into a complex story about how there was no good, good sides of a war. The Serbians and the Croatians were both being depicted as not exactly savory characters. I did a few sets you know, sound design pieces for that. And then all of the production crew was fired uh, by the producers because they wanted to gain control of, of the film from the director and make it more of a war film, make it more jingoistic, more, you know, rah, rah, good side, bad side kind of thing. And the irony is 9-11 happened and then the release of the film was delayed because everything, was still, everything stopped. You know, if they had made a complex drama where there were no good sides, it might have been actually a really useful film to have put out. But as it was, it probably wouldn't have succeeded if they had done that. But as a jingoistic war film where it's rah, rah, let's go kill the bad guys, you know, maybe that's exactly what they wanted at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh, know. You, you know. You know what, one of the interesting things about Paul Hasslinger, you say, I obviously don't know him. I'm aware of his name, some of the work he's done. I used to review a lot of film scores because I find I found, remember how you're saying, find something that's uniquely, uniquely you and kind of stay with that. Well, I found there's probably not a lot of guys that want to review movie scores. So I thought that might be one of my ways in to the business. So I started reviewing scores. I'd request stuff for whether it be a horror film like Don Davis scoring after Matrix, he scored a horror film called Valentine. Probably no one ever wanted to list that scary music. I did. And then I started getting music sent to me from composers out of nowhere. At one point, I got a score from Joseph Bishera, who scored The Conjuring and Insidious and Conjuring 2, etc. And, and I remember saying to him, why do you think he sent that to me? Oh, I told him you're the soundtrack guy. Paul Hasslinger 
had sent me the score of a couple of his films. I, I don't know if it was him or his assistant, a horror film called Vacancy. I've lost track of what he's working on. I knew he did Underworld series and he did some TV series that he asked me to help on. He did, Sleeper Cell was a thing I helped a bit with. He also had a, a world music type release that wasn't a film. One of them was called Score. Yeah. Another one was, I think, called World, world, world Without Rules. Yeah, that's it. World Without Rules. I have those downstairs in my basement. Those are excellent albums. Paul's been a friend for 30 years now, I guess. Wonderful guy and, and very hardworking, super talented. Um, I mean, when he joined Tangerine Dream, he was right out of Vienna Academy and he didn't even know who they were. He was a classically <laughs> trained kid. He was 21 years old, just gotten out of school. He and I are the same age. He had, he had just gone out of school and they were starting to get a lot of film scores at the time. Needed somebody who was classically trained. They needed somebody who could talk to orchestras and who could just get that extra little level because they were just self-taught hippies, you know? <laughs> they were just, they were noodling with their synths. And, and yeah. they really needed somebody who had those skills. And he came, I think he recorded some like 80 albums worth of music with them. In the, in the eight years he was in the group. I've heard, that, I've read that you've performed in caves, planetaria, art galleries, concert halls throughout Europe and the world. What's been the most unusual place out of all of them that you ever played? What was your favorite and why? And what was your least favorite and why? For me, the most unusual is probably the last concert I did in November of 2019, which was a three-day festival in Vietnam of 15,000. Uh, that's really, really unusual for me. <laughs> the Monsoon Festival in Hanoi. I came on after like a world music, world beat rock band and before a famous Vietnamese female singer-songwriter from uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Her name was Tian Tian. Actually, and, and she, most of the audience was there to hear her. You know, she was kind of a Taylor Swift of Vietnam. You know, and and, and very loved because she was sort of a feminist. But but feminist is is a slightly different thing um, in Vietnam. It just meant that she kind of wore slightly masculine clothing. <laughs> she sung about issues that girls. Nobody knew who I was, but I was. This was this eclectic festival that had like four artists each night. Just a really wide variety of people together. You know, a, a big light show. I had you know provided some video for them to project and then they had a bunch of that was to me very strange uh because i don't when you're in an outdoor festival that's that big the first row of the audience is like 50 feet away from you it's very foreign and it's at night so you really don't see anybody it's just another thing that was extremely gratifying for me was also in 2019 i think everything was starting to get really interesting events and and i played a sleep concert an all-night concert in gdansk Poland at the Solidarity Center, which is where Lech Walesa's office is. It's a five-story museum at the shipyards where the uh, where the Solidarity Revolution started in the early 80s. And this was the 30th anniversary of their first democratic election. Huge, huge festival that they had the, of the arts all the way around Gdansk. Played for 150, 200 people in the Solidarity Center, and it was the first time they had ever had it open to the public overnight. That was an honor, a great honor. And some of my favorite places are planetariums to play. I've played some really nice planetariums and also watching to see how planetaria as a art form are kind of falling by the wayside. It's a little sad. There's some lovely planetariums that are really in disuse now, and, and they're sort of getting a little ratty around the edges. And I'd love to see, especially, I have a deep fondness for those old Zeiss optical star generators mm -hmm. that have actual lenses and white light sources. Stars are so precise and, and they gleam in a different way than the laser projectors that they use now, which, which can program far more stars and you can get much more realistic sky fields but th the stars don't look the same there's there's something very specific about those old zeiss you've done a lot of different things obviously over the years has does everyone fall asleep during your sleep concerts and did you ever fall asleep ha, no i've never fallen asleep thank goodness i've come really close i, I do get the whiplash kind of thing like, you know. <laughs> but it's really hard to stay awake and be attentive for that long i'm, I'm i have a strong circadian rhythm the ones that work best for me nowadays, now that I'm kind of old, where I fly nine hour time zone shifts, I can just stay awake in my California time zone. Basically, it'll be like a morning or an evening concert in my body. Um, and that, that helps a lot. So does, you know, does most of the audience fall asleep during those shows? Yes and no. The intention is not to sleep deeply. The intention is to journey in your unconscious and to, to skim in and out of a light stage of sleep. And the fact is that when you're sleeping around a hundred other strangers, you're not going to sleep as well. There's going to be right. people snoring. I mean, the snoring is louder than my music. When I play these things, they're very, very quiet. You know, the ventilation and people moving around the room are louder than the music. What happens is that your sensitivity to sound becomes very heightened. And so everything seems loud. 
because I play so quietly. People are more physiologically aroused because they're around strangers, they're in an unusual situa situation, and you basically have this sense of, of uniqueness. It's different from anything you've done before, so therefore there's a kind of an excitement and a little butterflies that prevents people from sleeping deeply. And that actually makes it more interesting for them because they're skimming in and out of this light stage of sleep and they can have more hypnagogic experiences. Is there something you haven't done that you've been yearning to try? Musically, <laughs> sonically, comp compositionally wise, recording wise, type of music. Is there something out there that you've never attempted that you still wanna venture into? What's weird is that I don't always think about it that way. And I don't mean to, to skirt around your question. I actually, mean this fundamentally as the, the nature of my, um, my creative life, is that the music usually tells me what has to happen, and the music isn't about me or what I want to say. It's really about what I need to hear, and it's about something that drives me forward. It's, it's as if I go into a private place and find a thing that needs to be said that's not part of me, it's something else. I figure out how to make it happen, and usually my skill level is right at the bottom of what I need to have to, to do it right. And I always find whatever I do is a compromise and usually probably a little half-assed compared to what I wish it could be. Of course, you know, there's times that I've wished, I wished, I once 30 years ago tried to write some string quartets and somebody who actually had classical training looked at my quartets and said, you know, this nobody can play this. And, and it wasn't difficult. It was just, I had weird phasing and time signatures and stuff. And, and I was very discouraged. <laughs> If he might have been wrong. I, I, I took that as like, I don't know what I'm doing. And it's true, I didn't know what I was doing. And I still don't. But, but I don't think of it in terms of categories. It's not like I want to make a jazz album next, or I want to make a pop album next, or something like that. It's, it's all just the music that has to be said, and it's a weird hermetic music. I don't know what wants to be said next, um, honestly. I think that's great. That's kind of um, what I do as a filmmaker. I don't always necessarily plan out what I want. I go by instinct, by gut feeling. Like my next movie, when I finished my previous movie back in January of 20, right before we got COVID, um, everyone kept asking me close to me, what are you doing next? And for me, I don't know how you feel, but when I finished the process of making that movie, I was so burned out because truthfully, I was working on four movies at the same time. And I'm like, I need a break. So I purposely took like a two month break and then I figured out what I wanted. And I didn't think about movies for two months because I felt that I needed that space. It's just like, I think with people with phones, laptop, all these electronic gadgets, we're always crammed for our time. I think sometimes we need to let go of all that stuff, even if it's a daily, a weekly, a monthly, to kind of get a break from it, because I think everybody needs that. I think a lot of the social media things have, have created a short attention span disease with our culture, and me too. I mean, I'll tell you, I, I'll work for 20 minutes and then I'll get distracted and it'll be, oh, what's on Facebook now? Is somebody trying to reach me? Check my email, all this kind of thing. Really destructive to the to the concentration cycle, uh, but I'm a victim of it as, as much as anyone. It's <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I can't say that I'm any different. I try not to do it as, I, I try to, on the weekends, if I'm home, I try to go as much as I can without looking at it. And you know, I, I don't know about you, but I work at a regular job that is a lot of computer-based. I wish filmmaking paid the bills, but it doesn't, not yet. I'm on a computer like eight hours a day. The carpal tunnel is very real, especially after 30 years of being on a keyboard. I find the less I touch my phone, the better my fingers and my thumbs and my hands feel. It's like the days I work on my phone the most, that's the worst I feel physically with my, by the hands. I'm funny with phones, I'm a bit of a Luddite. I really just use it for telephone. <laughs> Unless I'm traveling, if, if I'm in the car and I need Google or if I need something you know, on a website, yeah, I'll use maps or whatever I need to at the time. For the most part, the phone is in my pocket as a telephone. And unfortunately, all of the studio is, is around a computer now and so, and, and you it used to be, I had a rule in the studio until around 1999 or maybe 2000. And, no, it was probably all the way to 2004. My rule was the studio main audio computer would not be connected to the internet. But but you can't do that anymore because all the updates, everything's on the internet. I mean, the, the software is talking to a parent company half the time. There's no such thing as a computer that's not connected anymore. And look, I'm not saying it's all bad. I have a website. I promote my work. I found with social media, it doesn't really create income, like when I'm selling movies and stuff, but it gets information out. And you know, it's a self-promoting world now, and we all are trying to multitask with being creative and also then figuring out 
how to let people know that we did it. You know, it's like, hey, I did a thing. Come look at my thing. And you find yourself half the time just going, look at me, look at me. I feel sometimes like the internet metaphor is, is baby birds in a nest trying to get the worm from their mother. <laughs> yeah. Big open mouth. Wah, wah, feed me, feed me, feed me. Yeah. At a certain point, I just get exhausted. I don't want to be like that. And I'm, I'm sick of talking about myself. And I'd rather talk about the art and about society and where we're headed as a human species and things. But all of this self-promotion ends up becoming shallow. It's really just like, look at this thing I did. Here, buy my thing. Here's my new record. It's it's vinyl. Here, buy Neurogenesis on vinyl. It's pretty. I'm not, I'm not good at that. <laughs> well, well, I hope I hope you've had a little fun talking tonight. Absolutely. Hopefully, Thank you. hopefully this has been a little bit different than the normal quote unquote interview or podcast, right? Well, it's been good. And hopefully people aren't just, you know, numbed out by all the philosophy and history and stuff. But I've enjoyed it. And I appreciate what you do with your music. I find it very tranquil, very healthy, inspiring. You leave a lot of room for my imagination. And that's something I greatly appreciate. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, asking me to do this. Great. Well, you have a great night. Thank you, Robert, for coming into the depths. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for okay. inviting me.